again. It's good to see each of you. Uh, glad that you're here with us and able to spend some time with us. Uh, I'm not going to stay on the floor. I'm just going to start down here. People get worried when I come down the floor because it scares them. Because I, every time I down here, I say stuff that uh, uh, I try to come down when it's something controversial. But I just want to come hang with you for just a second. Um, it is good uh, to see each of you and be with you and to be able to spend some time with you uh, this morning and worshiping and thinking about things of God. Um, I'm gonna, we're starting a new series this morning, uh, themed really out of the book of Luke. We're going to start in Luke, and we'll be in Luke chapter 4 today, and that's kind of the, the kickoff. Uh, we're not going through all of Luke, but we're going to see something that happens throughout the book of Luke, and we're going to study about Jesus and what Jesus kind of inaugurates in Luke chapter 4 as he lays claim to an Old Testament idea, an idea about the concept of Jubilee. I don't know about you, um, my experiences with Jubilee growing up revolved around that old song, Heaven's Jubilee, you know, uh, that you sang really fast, and you only sang it when you had a bunch of people together that really knew how to sing, because it's really hard to sing, you know, and uh, that was my experience with uh, Heaven's Jubilee, uh, and, but I didn't know much about the concept of Jubilee, uh, well, well into um, much of my life, really, and uh, I still just feel like I'm just really discovering it in so many ways. Um, but Jubilee was a year that happened, and we'll talk about this a little bit more at length throughout this series, but a year that happened every 50 years in the Israel calendar, and it was a time of uh, where many things that had been uh, revert back to their origin. The, the origin of the idea is that the Israelites would be able to um, not take advantage of certain things and places, and so there was this year of reset. Uh, every seven years, there was a year of reset. Every seventh day, there was a <laughs> day of reset. But every seven sevens, which would be 49, and then the 50th year, there was an extra year. And this year was special because if you had lost land over the last several years, or whatever, everything went back to its original owners. Now, uh, Leviticus points out how this all works, you know, and in many, so basically there was a concept that if you bought something in year 48 and you knew Jubilee was two years away, you wouldn't pay full price. It was kind of like a long-term lease program, okay, if you want to get into the technicalities of the way this would work. But it was a protection. It was a protection for people because God knew that people sometimes get shut out. Sometimes things happen where we get kicked to the outside. Being on the outside is not fun, is it? You know, I mean, like being on the, we, even when we don't want to be on the inside, we say what? Yeah, if I could be a fly on the wall, right? Because even when we don't want to be on the inside, we want to be on the inside. We just don't want the consequences sometimes of being on the inside, right? Uh, nobody likes being left out. Uh, the concept of being left out is a, a scary concept that uh, ultimately impacts so much of what we do. And we learn this from the very youngest of ages. You start seeing kids at a very young age, and there's always this push-pull of, of how do we um, balance and make sure that kids are not just left out all the time. Because being left out hurts, doesn't it? I think... And I suppose, and I, I believe, that in some sense, everybody at some point in their life has had the experience of feeling left out. And I imagine that we could all recall the moments that you were left out. Because they tend to stick with you. Because they tend to hurt. And they tend to not be good for you. Uh, as far as how you... Uh, they can be good for you in the long term, but in the immediate term especially, it can really hurt and it can... It can stick with you. When Jesus comes and starts his ministry on earth, he's going to make a bold claim that we're going to see today where he's going to claim the year of Jubilee. He's going to identify that he was the one that was inaugurating the year of Jubilee. And in that year, great things were going to happen for those who had previously been left outside, who had been left on the margins of society. And you might say, oh, I'm popular, right? I'm not on the margins of society. I have people that like me. And, and I would say that, uh, congratulations, you know, good job. Uh, and uh, that's great. But religiously, every single individual in this audience, most likely, would have been on the outside looking in to the God of Israel's promises. 
And so while this is good news, and we're going to be talking a lot about the margins of society and those that live on the margins and how we're supposed to look out for them, we most certainly are supposed to do those things. But don't just assume that everybody out there is the margins. Because the good news of Jubilee is good news for you too. Because you are in the margins. And in many ways, we find out that anybody can be in the margins when Jesus inaugurates his Jubilee. And it's going to be powerful as we see what God is going to do. And we're going to follow it through Luke. And Luke does this cool thing. He announces this year of Jubilee. And then he's just going to go story after story after story where he's calling and dealing and pulling in people that the world and the religious world has specifically said, we don't need those. We don't need those. They can't come here. And it's going to be a powerful story, I think, of how God calls people off of the margins and then to them. And it impacts how we as Christians... One, feel about ourselves and how we think about ourselves. But two, who do we seek out? Who do we minister to? Who do we look out for? Uh, so often in churches, this has been the pull. How do we get families with two kids that are married and have a higher middle class income? And, you know, like we get these profiles of what we think we need to have in order to have a great church. And it's interesting that Jesus seemed to seek none of those people. He seek to seek the people on the margins, and he let God work out the details after that. And if you're a family and you're upper middle class and you've got two kids and a great marriage, praise God for that. We're not putting, we're not trying to cast you out. We're just simply pointing out the fact that we sometimes need to look further to these other people, and those who have much need to look for those who don't have as much. And so we're going to start this series in Luke chapter 4. And before we start into Luke 4, I want to say a prayer. And then I'm going to come up here and we'll start going through the text. Thank you, God, for calling us. Every one of us has been brought to this place where we can hear the good news of Jesus. And because of that, we are blessed. We're mindful of those who have not had that blessing. And we are mindful that... Um, we're just mindful of how blessed we are when we come together this morning. Help us to not view with those who have not seen just with pity, but rather with action to reach and to, to seek to reach those that are on the margins of society. Not only just society, God, but help us to find the people that are on the margins of the religious world and in our churches. We have a tendency to want to be uh, special and we know that we are special in your eyes God but we also know that you are a big God with a big tent and we seek to want to bring people under that tent help us to bring people under that tent not not to be selfish with our blessings not to be selfish with our uh, selves not to not to look down on those uh, who may view things somewhat differently than us help us to recognize that that so often you saw in people and circumstances things that we as humans could not. But we also pray to have your eyes, that you will form us to be more like your son, Jesus, that you will allow us to see hurt, see pain, see the struggles, and to know the right things to do in the ways we minister to those that are hurting. We praise God that there is jubilee, there is hope. And in that, we want to rest in that hope over these next several weeks as we explore his life and how he brought in people that the world had rejected. Thank you for loving us. Help us to see clearly as we go through this passage. Help me to be able to articulate things clearly, not just by my own power, but may your spirit work through me to touch hearts, minds, souls. It's in Jesus we, as a church, Give this prayer, and the church together says it. Amen. 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 Right, we'll go up here. Oh, there you go. It knew I was coming. Uh, so it disconnected. I should have stayed down there. So. All right, there we go back up. All right, let's go to Luke chapter 4. We're going to begin in verse 16. Jesus here goes to Nazareth. Um, oh, that's the wrong thing. It's going to cut off part of the screen. 
There we go. I apologize. Sorry. There we go. All right. There we go. Jesus goes to Nazareth. Where is Nazareth? Church? Say it out loud. What is Nazareth to Jesus? Home, right? Say it loud. All right. Make sure you're still awake. All right. All right. So Jesus goes home, right? What is home to you? A home to me and you is a place of uh, comfort, right? A place that you can feel yourself and be yourself the most. And the more you can be yourself, the more you call that thing home, right? Uh, if I'm in Birmingham, I'm at home, right? Uh, but I don't go through random people's cabinets in their kitchen, right? But if I go to my mom's house, the cabinets are fair game, right? And so the closer and closer we go to things that are dear to us, we call that more and more home. Like there's like levels of home. So this is his home, uh, but it's also where his home is. And obviously the people here are going to recognize him. So he's around people that have at some point in his life known him. And you would think that would be a, a good thing. So Jesus goes home. We're going to find out it's not. He had been brought up here, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. Jesus had, this, had a history of what Jews did. They went to the Sabbath to, to, to read and to, to observe things on the Sabbath. And he stood up in the midst. It's his turn to read, and they would have been taking turns to read. He stood up in their midst and read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unscrolling it, he found the place where it is written. He goes to, he says, ah, this is, this is where I want to read. And he goes to Isaiah chapter 61, and here's what he says. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has appointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. There's a whole lot that goes on here that you may see or may not see. I don't you, initially, at least. Um, we will dig into some of that more as we go along. Most likely, we'll come back and make some references to this. But you need to understand that what Jesus is proclaiming in Isaiah here had had already become known in the Jewish world of his time as a reference to a jubilee year. You know, I talked about this 50th year that comes around for Jewish people. Well, that was no longer a thing when Jesus comes along. It, it's not that it wasn't a thing. I mean, they talked about it and they, they, they had ideas about it, but they had long been kicked out of their land. Nobody was getting their land back from the Romans when Jesus comes around. Uh, like, and that was part of a lot of the Romans' concern was, wasn't it? These Jewish people, they want their land back. <laughs> you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of concern among the Romans not having an insurrection and trying to get their land back, so to speak. And so when Jesus comes along, there's a, there's a concept, an idea, of what Jubilee would be if it were to start again. But the idea of an actual Jubilee no longer exists. And there's linguistic, there's like words here that play into this as well, where we know that this, Jesus is talking about the fact that he is coming, uh, that, that this is a, a reference to the Jubilee year, where there's hope for people who have lost hope, there's good news coming to those who don't have. Maybe you were in a situation where you had to sell your family property. Well, there's good news on the horizon because there's a day this all resets, restarts, and we get to, you get another chance, a new breath of life into a, a barren world. And he says, I, I've come into, I'm going to proclaim this. Uh, and the slaves would, anybody who had, maybe you, they, you had got real desperate and said, I've got to go be a slave to somebody, somebody else. Well, in this year, you were going to get set, set free. And Jesus says, there's going to be sight for the blind. There, there's hope in this year to proclaim the year of the Lord. So what's Jesus going to say after he's read this? He rolls the scroll up. And, and I love to like put myself in the shoes there. And I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what Jesus is like. I mean, I, he's got a beard and a mustache, we know, because, you know, all the pictures. Um, but, but, you know, I don't, I don't know what Jesus looks like. I, I, don't, I don't have any idea. But you have these images that go through your head. He rolls the scroll up slowly. He gives it back to the person sitting there. And he goes back. And he sits down. And everybody's watching what he's doing. Which lets us know this is not normal behavior. He's done something like that real quiet so people would pay attention. Yeah. I've learned that with my kids, I can yell and they'll get their attention. But you know what gets their attention way better? 
whispering. It's weird, but it, it's like something different. You know, they hear yelling. They don't hear people in our world whisper a whole lot. And if they hear me whisper, they know it's not good. <laughs> okay. It's not good if I'm whispering. Okay. I don't know what it is, but I can imagine there's a still in the room and everybody's eyes are fastened on everybody's eyes are fastened on Jesus. He looks at them and he says, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Ah, whoa, 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 whoa. That that is unbelievably bold. Jesus just said that when you heard this, it became true. You know who can make scripture become true? Well, I mean, maybe a prophet could work in the, the God, in the place of God to make something come true. Maybe, I, I don't know, but, but they had been wondering, are we ever going to have this jubilee back? And Jesus says, congratulations, jubilee time. It just happened. You were here and you witnessed it. I, I don't know what happened, but he's mesmerized the crowd at this time, and for whatever reason, they are, they are happy about what's happened. They all speak well of him, and they say they're, they're amazed at his gracious words that came from his lips. They're like, something special is happening. I don't know what, what it is. They say, isn't this Joseph's son? Like, we know this kid. This kid grew up here, you know, like, and he's really doing something interesting and unique and we we think we like it he's talking about jubilee we like jubilee we want jubilee here's that jubilee year consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants it shall be a jubilee for you each of you is to return to your family property and to your own clan now if you were hearing and sitting at Jesus' feet. And let's say you had family land that had become very expensive in the Roman Empire during that day. And somebody that sounds like they know what they're talking about, you're not sure why they do, but they say, guess what? You're about to get your family land back. And the bondage that you're under, which would be the bondage under the Romans, it's about to happen. You're going to love what Jesus is saying here, aren't you? You're going to love the idea that there's a new freedom that's coming up on the horizon. And interestingly, around Jewish time, there was a reality among many Jews, seemingly, from what we have in some records, that they were looking for a Messiah to bring on the year of the Lord, to bring on the Jubilee. And there was a large way in which they were looking at this as a spiritual thing. It had been spiritualized at this point. In other words, we, we're at Jubilee. We're not sure if we're ever going to get our land back. But we are looking for a Messiah that's going to come away and take away our sins. Now, there were some that were very there's militant Jews that are still, we need our land back. Right? Wherever you're at on this spectrum, Jesus shows up on the scene and he's either offering you forgiveness of sins, maybe, or he's offering you your family land, or he's offering to remove the oppression from the Romans. Because for a Jew, you couldn't be freed in the sense that God wanted you to be if you were under oppression to the Romans. And so like, he's offering something to you that you like. You don't know what he's offering in many ways. You don't know what that looks like, but you like it, right? Some, you heard the call. Somebody's giving away something and I'm going to show up. And what's the worst thing that happens, right? And they like that about Jesus because he's going to offer them something. And the Jubilee year was, it was life for so many Jews. I want to pause here for just a minute. I want to just look at some of the things that the Jubilee year did for people. For people, and then we're going to look at how they responded to Jesus and how Jesus responded to them. And guess what? It's just like every other time Jesus shows up, it's not what you expect, right? He does something totally off off script. Like you can write the scripts, but you can't write this one, right? And Jesus goes off script, and he's going to do it again here. Here's why Jubilee was good news for those that would have heard this and for those that were living in Israel. First off, Ju Jubilee held the wealthy accountable. Uh, it put a limit in many ways on how wealthy an Israelite could become, so to speak. It, it was life and it protected the poor from uh, having generational times that you would have a tribe. Let's say you had one of these 12 tribes and these tribal lands and, and one of them became very poor over a series of years. It, it protected the, the people from anybody getting too rich or 
too poor. Now, I'm not getting political, hear me clearly, but uh, everything you hear right now in the politics is aimed at what? Telling people, I mean, both sides, all sides say this, right? We, we, well, we, they might say we want everybody to be rich, but we don't want anybody to be too poor, and we don't want anybody to be too rich, right? We all recognize that that's probably, there's probably a, like, uh, I mean, Elon Musk probably doesn't actually need like a trillion dollars, right? He could probably survive on like half a trillion or something. I don't know. I'm all right, like, we recognize that there's a time where you get more money than you can even do anything with it, right? And we also recognize a poverty problem. Now, why I'm not getting the politics is I'm not trying to say that we all agree how we fix that problem, what it looks like. We, we will have major disagreements about that, and it will start a war, and we might have half of you leave next Sunday. I'm not even sure which half. Uh, maybe all of you would. Uh, I don't know. But like, what I'm saying, though, is we all recognize there's a problem, though, right? We recognize that we want, we want people to be able to sustain themselves and to have enough to live, and we want people to do well on some level. Uh, the problem is, is we tend to want people to do well as long as it doesn't stop me from doing well too, right? And, and what Jubilee created was a system, God's system, that says uh, this is going to prevent anybody from getting too wealthy, so wealthy that they just have and have and have, and, and it's going to keep... Anybody from getting so poor that they no, have no hope for their family and their lineage and the people and their children and their grandchildren. And so God instituted this time where they would get back, right? It would be a reset, a restart, a redoing uh, of the time. But this jubilee, jubilee year was not just about the reset in the sense of getting land back and people being freed from oppression. It was also a time, as would happen on all of the seventh years, all of the, the, the seventh years, the, the people would not farm the land. They would just live off the land. Whatever the land gave them, they had to, to take it. And that was all they had in those years. And so this became not only a time to reset macro, big things, it was also a time for you to reset. You weren't out plowing fields. You, you weren't out... Uh, pushing the, uh, the animals, you, you were having to, by Jewish law, having to stop and trust God and, and let go of some control during this time. And so it, it gave everybody a time to reset. It's what the Sabbath on Sunday became like a mini version, and then you have the bigger version every seven years. And then you have the real big version every 50th year. And this was the big reset. Everything resets. It was a call for you to reset and for me to reset. For all, all the Jews, it would have been time for them to reset. To stop what they were doing and to recognize and to have to depend and lean into God in difficult times. Sometimes, you know, if what, what, what happens? What hap and because that's what your mind goes. Well, what happens if, you know, we're, we're depending on this grape vine that has been providing fruit for my family, but I'm about to go now in this jubilee year, two years, and you've told me I can't do anything to support the life of that plant. Well, that is difficult for us as humans, isn't it? To, when God says, you have to not touch. Uh, I mean, like, that's the primary problem of humanity from the very beginning, right? That we could not touch things, right? And when you get a two-year-old, you realize what? The first problem a kid has is what? They can't not touch things, right? Uh, so maybe that's all of our problem is. We, we can't not take what we want. We struggle with it. And they had to stop and release it. They had to release control over to God. And so it was a time of individual reset. It was also a time for the land itself to reset. I mean, we know this just kind of from modern farming, that sometimes the land needs time to reset. Now, we've, we've gotten good with chemicals and I don't know. All, there's lots of science now where there's ways that you can kind of speed up this reset. But at the end of the day, I've, I, I believe it's still fundamentally pretty true that there's some times that the land needs some time to just rest in order for farming to be cultivated in a proper way. And so this was a time for that land, to, for God's creation to, to reset. Uh, again, not getting into politics. I'm not, I promise I'm not. But uh, if you could have a day, if you could have a year where no pollution went up in the air and nobody destroyed and nobody knocked down a tree, I mean, uh, you can imagine how the world may heal some in that year, couldn't you? Uh, I mean, we would probably struggle because we don't have toilet paper if we can't take no trees, right? But I mean, but you see that the land itself needs that time of healing and land needs a time to rest. And this was a time for that, that to happen. Also, this was a time 
Sabbath, uh, just coming off this temple series, it all ties into this a little bit. Uh, Jubilee year was a time that you had to rest in God. It wasn't just about resting. I mean, like, they're stopping, right? Just stopping working, not working, sitting on the couch watching TV. That's, and I'm not telling you, I mean, we, there's a time for that. That's fine. But that's not the kind of rest God calls people to in Sabbaths and sabbatical years and in Jubilee years. He's calling them to sit with him. There's a difference between sitting and sitting with God. I mean, one may in some ways reset you. Like, it may, like, physically reset you. It may emotionally regulate you temporarily. But the other is life. I mean, resting in the peace of God. Sitting with God. And being forced to sit with God. I can just see now, you know, I'm going to pull in another Bible story here. If you don't know the story, you can go read if you want to. I'm, I, I hate to pull this in because I hate to not give you all the context of this. But if you don't know the story, you can come to me and ask, what do you mean? I'll try to explain it to you. But let me just say this. Martha has probably hated Jubilee. And Mary's loved it. The idea of stopping working and stopping doing, I mean, was, is totally foreign to some people out there wired. And God knew that if or, in order for you to have real life, long-term life, there were going to be some times that you were going to have to go against the way you were wired or the way you were raised or the way you feel. And sometimes you need to stop and reset. And that's what Jubilee was. And so when Jews, Jesus walks back into his hometown on a random Sabbath day and sits down and reads Isaiah and does it in this mysterious way where everybody looks at him and he says, you saw it happen here today. You probably didn't know what to think. Some of them definitely thought there was life in this. I would imagine, just imagine with me, that in this culture of this individual synagogue in this little town, there were like some leaders, there were probably some people on the fringes of that, hearing that, that day. And I imagine for the people on the, the fringes, it meant even more than to the leaders that thought they had it all going on. Because rest from politics, I mean... You know, I keep saying I'm not getting political. I'm, let me be political. I am ready. What day is election? Somebody tell me. What's the day? I don't remember. November what? Huh? All right, I'm ready for November 6th. Anybody else ready for November 6th? It's ready for me. Well, it's probably going to be like December, but whatever. I'm, you know you know what I mean, right? Like, you ready for it to be over? You need rest from that because it gets weary carrying the burdens of politics and pressures of family and all this stuff. And, and you need some, some rest in this. And let me tell you, the people who are being taken advantage of probably hear more hope in Jesus' word than anybody. But Jesus is not going to leave there making anybody ultimately happy. That's the interesting thing. He's told them the best news of your life. And they're about to try to kill him. Because they weren't ready for it. They weren't ready to hear this good news. Jesus says to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, Do here in your hometown what we've heard that you did in Capernaum. We, we heard you were doing some stuff over there. Now do that cool stuff for us too. And he says, Truly I tell you. And he continues, he quotes here. He says, No prophet is accepted in his hometown. There, there's a real sense in which it's hard to minister and to to lead people when they knew you when you were a snotty, bratty eight-year-old. Okay? Still true today, by the way. It's still tough, tough for that to happen. Um, and he says, No prophet is accepted in his hometown. Jesus already, they're probably thinking. How did, well, first of all, how did he know we were about to ask him to do some of these cool miracles? And what, what's he doing? It's like, we're, we're like telling him he's good. We, we like what you're saying, Jesus. And Jesus is like, you don't get it. 
I'm about to make you really mad. He's not doing it just to make them mad. He's just doing it because what he's really saying in this moment, they don't like. He's about to explain exactly what he means by this. He says, I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time. When the sky was shut for three and a half years, just like it seems like it's been here for three and a half years. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, but uh, we got some rain today, though. And there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yeah, Elijah was not sent to any of them. Elijah was on the run. He was fearful of his life, and God gives him protection. Where does God give him protection? He sends him to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Now, you read that as a modern American, you probably think, oh, what, does that, what does that mean? He's saying... You know, Elijah, the great prophet Elijah that I just quoted, the one that you are just waiting on this jubilee to happen, there was a time where he lived and he was in danger. And Israel should have been surrounding him and learning from him. And they were instead, instead he was being surrounded by the enemies and he was about to be killed for what he was saying. And God sends him somewhere to a sweet widow, Jewish widow's house. No, that's not what he does. He sent Elijah to a Gentile's house. Now, that may not mean much to you, but to a first century Jew, you didn't just step on their toes when you said that. You were slapping them in the face when you said that. And he says, and... There were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed. Only Naaman, the one who came and asked, you know, God cleanses this man. Who is Naaman? The Syrian, the Gentile, the not Jew. So the audience at this point locked into Jesus, thinks it's cool, let's figure out what's going on here. And he starts talking about God blessing the Gentiles. He starts talking about people who are outcast and on the margins. He says, I'm here to bring Jubilee, and guess what? Now let's talk about the Gentiles. And they said, the, G the Gentiles don't get Jubilee. It's when we're supposed to get our stuff back. It's about me and us, and about us getting the forgiveness of sins and having a Messiah to save us. And this man here says it's happening right now. And now he's talking about Gentiles. What are you talking about, Jesus? They're probably a little bit confused, but they're a whole lot of angry. Okay? They may be a little bit of both, but here's the next text. It doesn't say all the people in the synagogue were furious. They, didn't, they weren't stopping to ask questions at this point, right? There's the kind of mad that you get at somebody where you're willing to hear them out. And there's the kind of mad that you get at somebody where you're not asking any more questions, right? We've all been there, right? We're tired of the talk at this point. They're already tired of the talk. It took Jesus exactly one paragraph of statements to make them go from, we're going to find out more about this guy. This is good. To, this guy's the worst person we've ever seen. How do we get him out of this synagogue as fast as we can, right? One, one paragraph. Because Jesus had the audacity to say that the Jubilee is happening. And guess what? Let's talk about the Gentiles. Oh, because the good news of Jesus is going to become hope not just for those that are on the inside. It's going to become hope for those that are on the, the outside and are stuck out there. And they want to come in. But because there are the barriers, there are the leaders... There are the people who have made the rules that said, you don't belong here. They're stuck outside the walls of the temple. They're stuck outside the walls of the tabernacle. They can see God's presence, but they can't yet be in God's presence. They can see that God rests on the temple, but they can't live yet in that rest because the, the turmoil of their life was real and their poverty was real and their malformities, their blindness, their deafness, their, their inability to have and to deal with the problems they had, it was real. And, and for them, what, God, I want you to bring Jubilee. This is what the Jewish people said. We want you to bring Jubilee, but Jubilee for me, not for them. And if the kind of Jubilee you're bringing 
means that I've got to let other people inside my little club, the Israelite says, I don't want any part of that kind of jubilee. You see, Jesus brings about a jubilee that not only includes forgiveness of sins, it, it, it provides a lifeline of hope for uh, the, those who are depressed socioeconomically, those who are struggling on the fringes of society with mental illnesses, those who are, are struggling with hurt and loss and pain and grief, those people that the world kind of pushes to the side, the ones that you look at and you think something's just off about them in this moment and the world kind of pushes them to the side. Jesus says, you know, we got to pay attention to those people too. And the Jews are sitting back and saying, no, God, it's time just to take over the world. Let us rule. Let those people be our slaves. Let them be indebted to us. And Jesus says, I'm coming to bring debt relief. And it's not just for you Jews. It's for the outskirts of the society. And so what do they do? They stand up. All those eyes that were so mysteriously looking at Jesus and wondering what he would do just a few minutes ago, they all now stand up. And in a scene that I can only say, the only time, I mean, the scene that always comes to my mind, y'all seen Beauty and the Beast? Have y'all seen Beauty and the Beast? You know, when Gaston gets all excited and he gets them all fired up, kill the beast, right? And they, they all get their pitchforks and their torches and they're climbing up to y'all remember this y'all know this if you don't know it i mean you're you're a little late but you can still get there disney plus still exists all right all right so like being the beast there they're out and they're going to kill the beast right and that's exactly what this is they're they're a happy little town and all of a sudden now it's kill the beast they get up and they drive him out of the town I, I, I picture in my picturing of this that they are physically pushing him out of the town at this point. Maybe they're holding his arm. I don't know what they're doing, but they're, they're dragging him. By the way, it's a scene that kind of reminds you of something else Jesus is going to experience a few years after this, doesn't it? As they are driving him out of a town in rejection. You see, we're getting a little picture of rejection, and there's going to be another picture of it on the horizon. But the time's not right yet. But they push him to a hill on which the town was built. And here's the purpose. Nobody's thinking about justice. Nobody's thinking about whether or not we had the right to kill this man. He's just said some pretty controversial things that they would have probably in their mind said, that is heresy. That's probably what they said. That is, you, you have defiled God. That's what they would have said in the anger of that moment. But they weren't stopping to take a vote. They weren't stopping to see and they're going to throw him off this cliff. And Jesus just does the coolest thing. Um, it's one of my favorite texts in the Bible because it's like so simple. And it's like Luke says it. And like I can, you know, I don't know if y'all watch deadpan actors, people that can just say things with straight, straight face. They're really funny. I mean, I think this is like a Luke deadpan moment. But he walked right back through the crowd and went on his way. <laughs> is that not cool? I mean, like, I don't know about you. Like, I don't know if he turned in, like, I, I don't know. I don't know if, like, he, like, I kind of get this, like, Red Sea moment, right? Like, the people just part the way, and, like, they're, they're like the angry walls of the water as the people walk through on dry land, and they want to fight through, but it's like God's frozen them. I don't know what's happened, but, like, I, I get this picture of them, like, against this, like, invisible wall, and they can't get past, and they just have to watch Jesus walk by, and, like, you know, how... They're about, there's a group of people about to throw him off a cliff. And Luke says, yeah, but Jesus just walked right back through. It's just cool to me. I don't know why. Um, man, they were really angry about some other people getting the blessings that they thought were for them, weren't they? Um, here's what happens here and where we go from here and where we'll go kind of from here. What Jesus brings to the table is that if you're ever going to experience jubilee, if you're ever going to experience the peace and the release and the letting go, Israel is going to have to share it with people it was not yet comfortable and not ready to share it with. You see, they were going to have to let go. They were going to have to let God. They were going to have to release it to God. 
And they were going to, while they had different views of what Jubilee would look like, and they had largely given up probably on this idea of the reclaiming of the just, you know, like the, the tribes. But, but they definitely believed that there was a Messiah that eventually would get that back to them somehow. But they were mostly, they were kind of looking for these forgiveness sins. We want, we want to be cleansed. We want that, right? We want these good things. Like, like they get it on some level. They want it. Thing. God doesn't say, you know, you can have it if you work really hard for it. That's the opposite of Jubilee, right? I mean, the opposite of Jubilee. If Jubilee is this gift of life giving gift, this gift of peace and rest in the middle, you know, in the, this, this ability to stop and rest with God, I mean, the opposite of that is having to work for it. And Jesus does not say you have to work for it. As a matter of fact, quite the opposite. He said you just got to let go. Because Jesus in this moment is fulfilling a promise that through Abraham, not only would the nation of Israel be blessed, but all nations of the earth will be blessed. This is... This, hear me, church, when I say this, this is so important for us as a church. Um, I know religious history, I know baggage, I know all that stuff. But if we sit around and all we're worried about in the realm of the Christian world that God has created is who is in and who is out, we stand the risk of being outside ourself because we will miss the jubilee that God has given us. Because we're too busy being the people who want to decide who's in and out. And God says, you've got to release the power and control in this year. In this year of Jubilee. And that's what Jesus is bringing. He's bringing a year of Jubilee that will not end. He's bringing retirement. And some of you have retired and went back to work before. Right? Because you like working. And there's nothing wrong with that. God designed you to work and we'll, we'll work. But this is the kind of retirement where you're fulfilled. But it's not just for you. And it's not just for me. It's for all those who are willing to bow their knee down to King Jesus. And to, to bring others into him. We, and when we see those that are on the outside coming in answer is ours do we reject that and say that's not the image of jubilee i had and today we would say that's not the image of church that someone sold to me or do we instead say what god is creating here is god's work and we just want to bless it and we want to grow it and we want to we want to feed it but we want to let God be in control you can be in control and it won't end well you can let God and you can let go of a lot of the anxieties that the world is trying to crush you with because he's trying to bring other people to the margins in order to do that, you've got to look, you know. Um, Christians look a little really worked up sometimes, right? Like if, you know, go, go look on, nah, don't. But if you went and looked on social media and just Googled right now, Christians talking about politics, there's a good chance the first 50 results are going to be some people that are really angry, really worried, really anxious, really stressed. But that is not the image that God wants you to portray out into the world. He says, in this tent of my tent, there's rest for everyone. I want you to say that. And we're going to see it all through the book of Luke as we see this. It's going to be really fun to watch it unfold. So I'm excited about it. I hope you're excited about it. Uh, it's going it's, to, it's a blessing. Uh, this book is a blessing and uh, how he shows Jubilee unfold for us. He's um, started with the beginning. Or he started with the end, right? He's told us the end is Jubilee. And now we're going to watch it unfold in his life. He's going to show us what Jubilee means. And we're going to leave thinking 
you know, I came here, I didn't know much about Jubilee, but now I want to be part of Jubilee, right? Heaven's Jubilee, and we'll sing that song, and we'll figure out how to sing it together. But, but anyway, in the end, we're going to get to sing it together. It's powerful. It's powerful. Thank you for being here. Uh, we want you to be part of this. Uh, we want the life of Christianity to be something that is appealing, not just so that you'll join us, but we, um, I hope, if we're living into the promises of God, it is a life that is fulfilling, not always without its troubles, but always with the Prince of Peace leading it and giving it life. And we hope that that would be you. We'd love for you to, to encourage you to put off old life and start new life and to, to ask questions and ask lots of questions about what I need to do to be a part of this life. And it's not just a list of things that we will give you. That's not what we're here to do. We're not here to give you a list so you can work your way so that you can maybe obtain this. But as a matter of fact, that's not it at all. We're saying... In order to become a Christ follower, the picture of the Bible is to let go and let God and let him have control of your life in a way that not going to make sense to a lot on the outside. It's not going to make sense to some of them, um, but it can, be make, it can make sense for you because there's life there. There's life in Jesus. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. There's life in Jesus. Y'all were a little anxious. Y'all might be asleep by now. Y'all, there's life in Jesus. There's life in Jesus, and we want you to have that life. If you're on the margins and you're hunting somewhere to come in, we just pray that you will let us bring you in. If you are uh, hurting, anyway, we'd love to help you. All we'll sing a song together.